Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast listeners. My name is Juan Thomas. I have the honor of serving as chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section. And I'm so honored today to have as our guest, one of our past chairs, Lauren Ricklein, who was chair of the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice during the 2015-16 bar year. And she's also the editor of Her Honor, Stories of Challenge and Triumph for Women Judges. Lauren, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with the section and with you. Well, we appreciate your leadership in our section and in our profession. Um, you've been a leader in the bar, not just in the ABA, but also in Massachusetts. Um, I believe you're also a past president of the Boston Bar Association, correct? Yes, I right. am. Thank you. Yes. So you've done this tour more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so today we're going to talk about, in honor of Women's History Month, the book that you edited um, that I just referenced. Could you kind of share with us um, your inspiration for working on this book um, and how are these judges selected? Sure. Um, so um, in August of 2020, I got a call from um, some a couple of people, actually, who were on the ed bo editorial board, newly formed editorial board of the Judicial Division. And they were trying to figure out what kind of books they wanted to do. And somebody there had the idea of asking judges to write about themselves, um, finding prominent judges who would do that. And uh, someone suggested that I should be asked to edit that book. And when I got called, it was August 2020, which, as we all know, um, we all weren't getting out a whole lot. No, and I no. thought, oh, this would be such a wonderful project, you know, at a time when you know, we're all home and, and, you know, living through such a difficult time. And um, what I agreed but asked that there, there be an effort to make sure that the judges talk openly about real challenges and real issues. And then that was one piece of, of, the, of, the, of the challenge for us. And then the other was they wanted to focus on prominent judges and how do you choose who's a prominent judge in a country in which we are blessed with a lot of very prominent, talented female judges. So it occurred to me as we were thinking about this that one, kind of easy demarcation might be those judges who've received the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award from the ABA. It's considered a very prestigious award within the ABA. It's always a very big deal um, program. And you are an honorary yourself. I am. Thank you. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's something that really does stay with you. And um, and, and we, do, uh, you know, the ABA honors at least one, sometimes two judges each year. And um, if so, there were and there was enough of a pool of judges. If we had enough, say yes. And we, what we did was we actually um, enlisted uh, two former Brent winners, Judge Donald from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and um, Judge McEwen from the Ninth Circuit, and asked if they would be signatories to a letter that would go out to the judges and, and invite them to participate. And um, that's how that's how it all started in, in terms of so wow. the selection. And we were lucky that we had more than we even anticipated who said that they would be happy to do this. So these judges <laughs> shared their story, shared their journey. And what I appreciate about the book and the work is it's more than just their resume. You know, I, I tell people, if you want to really want to learn about someone, don't read their resume. You want to understand their journey. And this work kind of tells that that journey. Um, were there common themes you saw or you discovered among these jurists that you that you could share with us? Yeah, of course. So I think um, the the one that is immediately stands out, of course, is th their theme of grit and resilience. Mm. They shared really tough stories about experiences with poverty, with sexual harassment, with discrimination, uh, you know, you, you name it. And, you know, it was, it's in that book and they were talking openly and honestly about it. And yet 
they were able to persevere through these experiences to, you know, what many of us would consider to be among the highest jobs in our profession, of course. And so that's a really critical theme. Um, and, and that's why I, find, I, I hope the book will be an inspiration for people today on their career journey who, whatever you're experiencing, you can look at what these judges went through and say, well, okay, there, you, you can come out on, on the other side. Right. Um, but another thing that I thought was really interesting, and, and in some, it, it was one of my biggest editing challenges, is the tendency for, um, and, and I see this with a lot of successful women, um, a tendency to, to say, I was so lucky. Um, and and to to look at what happened to them in terms of just the, the their good fortune uh, without seeing how much their grit and perseverance and intelligence and hard work uh, that the, the what role that played uh, in their good luck. Right. So I I thought that was interesting, and and, and there were actually a, a couple of chapters in which I had to keep going back to the judge and say. Can we please use luck a little less when talking about this and focus more on what you did? Because it really wasn't just you got a lucky break here. Um, you did stuff to make this work. Um, so that was an, another very common theme as well that um, that I just thought was really interesting and tried to work through. One of the stories that is inspiring to me is um, Judge Bernice Donald's story. Mm -hmm. um, She's been a mentor to me personally, and actually reading her chapter reminded me of my grandmother, who's also from Mississippi. And today, March 22nd, would, would have been her 92nd birthday. Mm -hmm. She was an educator in Yazoo County, Mississippi. I wonder if you could share one or two stories that inspired you from the book um, and kind of share your what you thought about why that was an inspiration to you. Sure. I mean... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's every single chapter offers something to me that is inspirational. And that's why, you know, I feel so comfortable being so excited about the book because I didn't write it. It's other people's voices and other people who are remarkably inspirational. But you mentioned Bernice Donald, um, who is uh, so beloved within the ABA and, and, a, and a mentor to so many of us, whether she realizes it or not. I mean, just watching her um, is is a, a mentorship lesson in and of itself. She, yes. She's that remarkable. Um, but, but I was so struck by the way she talked about her early years in school and being in a segregate, you know, in the segregated South and watching how differently the white kids were treated than the black kids who still had to get taken out of school sometimes to work in the field. And her experience um, actually having to integrate um, uh, 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 with someone else, I think that they were the first black students in this white school and the horrible treatment that she endured from her teachers, from peers. And then she tells the story about how she she still worked hard. She succeeded. She did well. And she got offered scholarships and was never told about them. Her guidance counselors never told her that she had been offered college scholarships. And what she, she had a, a sense in there that really struck me in which she talked about how the institution itself conspired against her success at every stage. And the way she perfectly captured what institutional racism really is and how it operates in to affect people's lives uh, it, it so struck me and i think about the fact that you know if bernice donald tried to tell her story in a children's book in florida it would likely be banned if she talked about it in that same way wow. and that is stunning to me and it it should make all of us as lawyers, particularly in the ABA, be thinking about how do we push back against what we are seeing right now in, in terms of the regression that is happening with respect to civil rights and social justice. That is such an important point, an insightful point you, you make, 
Thank you for sharing that. Do you have any thoughts around what the ABA can or should be doing, um, particularly around promoting education? You know, we have a public education um, commission mm -hmm. that does a lot of work around public education. Our immediate past chair, our mutual friend, Beth Wittenberry, mm -hmm. her focus last year was around civic literacy, civic education. Um, do you have any thoughts on that yourself? Sure. So, um, I, you know, my wish list would be that the ABA would be front and center uh, on on the battle to protect democracy and the rule of law today. Oh. And, you know, I, and I think, you know, I have been involved now for a couple of years with Lawyers Defending the American Democracy, where, you know, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization strictly focus on how can we galvanize the legal profession to do more to protect, to protect democracy and the law. And, and, and I do this work as somebody who is a devoted bar leader. Um, I don't do it to replace my work in the ABA. I do it as a supplement to that work. Um, and I do it with other ABA leaders who, in fact, who are on our board. All of us hope that we can work within the structure of the ABA to have more focus on what is happening today in terms of the retrenchment of, of rights um, the, in, in, across the board. So, you know, my dream would be that I would turn on the TV in the morning and among all the talking heads that I'm watching would be the president of the ABA or that every time we see a new law happening or something uh, a proposal out there that you know we would see the ABA immediately with a statement and speaking out. And I think our job as bar leaders is to say to our colleagues in the profession, this is not a partisan fight. This is not a political fight. This is a fight to preserve democracy. And that's what I, I hope that we can get across ultimately. Totally agree, totally agree. Um, in your book, you also share something that I thought was very powerful. You talk about the importance of not being silent mm. um, when you see these discriminatory practices or, or, or actions. Um, that's in your introduction. Could you kind of speak to the importance of not being silent because you may be fearful? You know, many times we see injustice, but because we're afraid to either strain a relationship or lose a job or lose a position or lose status, we are silent, we say nothing. Um, could you kind of speak to that? Sure, um, and I appreciate the question because my last book actually, The Shield of Silence was an ABA published book in which I explored exactly that. How, how do we make sure that we do not remain silent in the face of this conduct and, and negative behavior? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, it's really core to a lot of the work that I do in my own life um, and my writing. And it was really a running theme in the book as well, um, in her honor. Uh, I, you know, one of the stories from one of the judges uh, was very poignant in which she talked about her role as um, an administrative presiding justice, where she had to make very difficult decisions about space. And we all know how sensitive issues about space are in the workplace um, and how there were judges who were really angry with her about the decisions that had to be made about who went where because of these space problems. And she was physically assaulted by one of her colleagues. Mm -hmm. And she wrote in reflection about that, how to this day, and this happened a long time ago, but to this day, she regrets her silence on that more than anything. Um, interestingly, she also talked about the fact that she wrote a 20 page, uh, you know, note to herself, letter to herself about exactly what happened um, in the event he ever sought a promotion, which apparently he did not. Mm -hmm. But so she was protective enough to do what needed to be done to, to for the future, but really regretted in real time not not speaking up against that type of behavior. And so, you know, a lot of what I think about and write about on this topic is the the need for people to 
work on strategies to speak up, whether it's as part of a coalition with affinity groups, with allies. Um, there are many ways to, to do that, but it is so important as a way to make life easier for the next generation for us to speak about injustices that we see today. Speaking of the next generation, that's a good lead into my next question. If you were the uh, banquet speaker at your law school and all the three L's were there about to graduate, and let's say you were giving a topic, a speech around, they want to become a judge. Would your advice to the female students be any different than the advice you would give to the male students in this present age that we're living in? Um, thank you for that question, because I think it's an important one in this regard. What Too often what happens is we think um, we our first thought, all of us, is to um, think about what women have to do. What do Blacks have to do? What do Asians have to do? What do Jewish people have to do? to be able to properly assimilate or get the next position or the opportunity. And what I think we have to make sure we are doing is to focus on what the institutions have to do. Mm. So I've tried really hard over the years to give advice to women that focuses on the same thing I would say to, to young men about how to succeed and get ahead. Um, with respect to you know perseverance and hard work and you know staying authentic to who you are, um, but what I have also tried very hard to do, and I know you do as well in in your work and the certainly the ABA and the section of civil rights and social justice, um, what we all do together is to change the institutions that make make us have to think about, oh, should women do something different? Should, you know, a particular race do something different? You know, do groups have to do different? The answer should be a, a strong no. The institutions have to figure out truly meritorious ways of leveling the playing field so that everybody can advance with equal opportunity. And we don't have to think in terms of, oh, do I have to do something that's against who I am authentically because I'm a woman? Right. That's a very important point because so often, and you, you said it, in these discussions, we're always asking what the group should be doing. I know in the black community, we're always taught we have to work twice as hard. Yeah, Well, absolutely. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't have to do that. If we change the institution, right? Exactly, right. exactly. Um, what are you working on now? Do you have a book project you're working on now? Or? <laughs> um, You've written so well, many. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm working on giving birth to this book, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, we all know that it's writing the book and getting the book out is one thing, and it's right, a brand right. new book. So I do spend a lot of time in that. In, in real, real life, though, most of my time, much of my time is going towards lawyers defending American democracy okay. um, because I have just become increasingly passionately committed to how we can all together do a better job in making sure we are not sliding state by state into autocracy. And, and I think you can make a very frightening argument that we're seeing that happen in states, very states across the country and in some of our national discourse. And, and again, I emphasize this has nothing to do with partisan politics. It has everything to do with the Constitution. Right. Exactly. Lauren, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, for people that don't know you very well, I'd like to ask our guest a few um, questions about their personal background. What do you do for fun? <laughs> I write books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think for me, fun is just hanging with my family, um, with my husband and my kids and their families. Uh, we have two little grandchildren, and my daughter is uh, about to have a baby. Uh, my son just has had, um, and his wife have had two. So, um, and we have four dogs. Um, so, you know, it's you got more it's, dogs than grandchildren. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. And if, and if so they far. keep having grandchildren, we'll keep having dogs. 
<laughs> we would definitely have a farm in the house if we could right. if we could arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a book you're reading now? Um, a lot. Yeah. yeah um, so I've been reading uh, Dahlia Lithwick's Lady Justice, which anything Dahlia Lithwick writes is poetry in motion. Um, I was very excited that she wrote the foreword for her honor um, because, you know, if, whenever I read anything she writes, I just cry because it's yeah. so beautiful. And she managed to do that with the foreword as well. Right. Um, um, and I'm, I've been reading a lot, you know, I have a stack, so some I've read and some I'm looking at, of books <laughs> that really talk about this time that we are in. Um, you know, how did we get here? How do we protect democracy and the rule of law? Um, right. What happened, you know, in, in various points in time over the last several years? So I've kind of immersing myself in all of that. Not That's most important. fun reading, but <laughs> it's important. <laughs> My last question to you today is, if you could wake up tomorrow morning and be anything except a lawyer, what would you be and why? That's an easy one, a journalist. Uh, um, I I have endless curiosity about people to the probably many um, of my friends would say to their consternation with my endless questioning. Um, but I do have really endless curiosity about people and I love to write. So I would absolutely have been a journalist if I did not become a lawyer. Well, that's wonderful. Well, we thank you for your work, your contribution to our profession again, to our section. Um, we encourage everyone to read um, the book that you've edited that we've talked about today. Again, Her Honor, Stories of Challenges and Triumph for women judges. Lauren, thank, thank you. you. I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Juan. It was great to see you. Absolutely.